narrative work for me entails not being afraid of your emotions mm -hmm. and the emotions of the people you're trying to reach. Welcome to We Are DeFree's Perspectives. We have a lot of responsibility. We reach thousands and millions of people through the projects that we're doing. We are a creative agency maximizing the positive impact on businesses, society and our planet. So if you currently look at all communication marketing campaigns, it's not always representing society. Radical change needs to happen now, otherwise brands and companies are going to get left behind. You know, if you're a marketing manager, if you're in a senior position, you're an opportunity maker. So how can you redistribute those opportunities in an interesting way? Every week, founder Mitchell talks to visionaries and change makers who are shaking up the status quo. We create content for every living soul on this planet. Get ready to be launched into a new perspective. What's your go-to comfort food? Right now? 75% dark Peruvian chocolate. <laughs> that sounded really lame. <laughs> what is something you don't do enough and of which you would like to do more often? Read and run. If any good book recommendations? Oh, yes. So there's this one book. It's entitled Flash Foresight. I think for any leader and manager, mm -hmm. that's just, to me, it was mind blowing. It's this guy who talks about how you can build an entire company, an entire idea on the basis of futures thinking. Mm -hmm. And where he talks about futures benchmarking. Flash Foresight by Daniel Burris. And fiction, uh, I love this author, Hannah, uh, Hannah Kristen. And she has this book called The Great Escape mm -hmm. about a family in Alaska. It's so vivid. It's so beautiful that after reading it, up until now, I still get confused. Uh, I somehow think I've been to Alaska. but it, And then I remind myself, no, you haven't been to Alaska. That's how good the book is. Okay. You really live and get immersed in yeah. Alaska. What's the greatest advice you've ever received? Ask. It was by this guy uh, who's a successful businessman, a friend of mine, and he said the best thing he's learned in life is that you ask. Because sometimes, even if you don't get what you're asking for, the fact that you ask shows humility mm -hmm. and you attract people to want to help you, to want to be with you. So just ask. What's the first thing you want to do if you won the lottery? I'm going to stop doing what I do now for work. Mm -hmm and do it without need of getting paid. I think there's just much deeper fulfillment in it. So I'm gonna stop working and just start doing things. So I'm Chris now, people call me Chris uh, Gomez. I'm from the Philippines, but I live in the Netherlands mm -hmm. now. I work with activists from different parts of the world to help them have more impact in their work, whether that be with their communications, with their innovative capabilities, mm -hmm. uh, with just being able to see the world from a multidisciplinary perspective. Mm -hmm. So that's what I do. How did you get there? I went to law school in the Philippines. I became a human rights lawyer mm -hmm. because I felt like th this was my way of giving back. Mm -hmm. I feel like I had a very pri privileged life because I grew up poor and ended up having education through scholarships. And I thought, wow, I should have never even gone into university. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to use what I learned, and that was law, to do what I thought was good. So I thought I was going to be this, you know, hardcore human rights lawyer appearing in courts and defending people who needed legal defense. Mm -hmm. But I ended up working in the grassroots in the Philippines, doing community organizing in places that had a lot of killings and disappearances of activists. Mm -hmm. And I worked with families, with the church, journalists, social workers. And I wanted to learn more about how this was done, how human rights work was done. So I left the Philippines to study further. I went to the U.S. Mm -hmm. And that basically led me into this trajectory where I met activists from different parts of the world who were confronting questions that I had about, are we really making an impact in the world? Mm -hmm. We're spending 
donor's money, on all of these things, are we actually helping that child somewhere in that refugee camp or this farmer in this uh, plot of land somewhere in Africa with what I'm doing in this office? Mm -hmm. So I had a bit of a crisis of impact. And so I thought I was going to leave human rights. But then after more soul searching, I realized I wasn't going to leave. I was going to stay, but I was going to double down on all my questions and help people who had questions like myself. So I started working behind the scenes and helping people like me have greater impact in their work. So I started getting trained in things that I never thought I'd get trained in, like design mm -hmm. thinking, foresight or futures thinking, systems design, theory of change, the stuff that as a lawyer you wouldn't think needed to be learned mm -hmm. or were relevant. But now I am so convinced, especially communications, are relevant to have impact in the world. Wow. It's quite a journey you've made there. Yeah. If we speak about narr the narratives, what does narrative work entail? Narrative work for me entails not being afraid of your emotions mm -hmm. and the emotions of the people you're trying to reach. And I think there's very little of that, at least in my field of social change. Mm -hmm. We're trained to be these professionals, you know, asking for laws to be changed, asking for rights to be respected, for violations to be stopped. Mm -hmm. And we, we use facts, a lot of facts. But then we forget that at the end of the day, the people on the other side or whatever side, we're all human beings. Mm -hmm. And we don't make decisions based on rational things, not based on facts, unfortunately. Facts are important. But what moves people, what changes hearts and minds, mm -hmm. are emotions, are people's sense of value and belonging. So to me, narrative is about not being afraid to dig deep into yourself. What are your own biases? Mm -hmm. And then dig deep into the into the biases and the emotions of the people you're trying to reach and convince. So that also like something that we always try and do is getting the end consumer or, or target audience, mm -hmm. getting them into the process. But while we are making the stories we are trying to tell, because we can only tell their stories yeah. as truthful and as authentic as possible by including them in the making process. Mm -hmm. And this is. And even for those who actually do this, mm -hmm. a lot of them are not doing it the way you're doing it. The person in the story often is an object, mm -hmm. not uh, not really an active protagonist of the yeah. story. So it's beautiful when you actually put the person at the center of the story mm -hmm. because it is their story. Yeah. Right? yeah. And it's not up on us yeah. to think how we should tell their stories. Yeah. We'd call that in design thinking radical empathy. The nonprofit and human rights space can be seen as quite a bureaucratic and complex to outsiders, including those it aims to support. Yeah. How do we put the human back into human rights? Yeah, that is the all-consuming question I have and I deal with and people like me deal with because human rights work and social change work really started because there was someone in the community that needed help. Mm -hmm. Someone is going hungry, people gathered together, and uh, there was someone in a workshop I was running yesterday, she said, the good, what was good about humanity, we gathered in squares and talked and really planned and we dreamt. That's really what the core of social change work is. But we wanted to be better at it. So we went and studied a lot, took 10 degrees, mm -hmm. someone with a PhD interning, applying to be an intern to, to, an, to somebody. Like, it, it's crazy. It's become so professionalized. But because the core spirit behind it mm -hmm. is we wanted to be better at what we do. But then along the way, we forgot to take along with us the very reason for why we wanted to be better. And those are those who are marginalized, people who are not uh, having access to a decent life. Mm -hmm. Putting the human back in human rights is just really pausing again and asking, oh, this castle, this huge complex infrastructure that we've built, is it really working directly to provide that person the decent life that that person deserves. Mm -hmm. When we require all these kinds of reports and we require all these kinds of hoops that a small, very idealistic grassroots organization somewhere in Uganda will have to go through, does that really serve the purpose 
of the idealism and the aspiration of that small organization. To me, the world is simple. There's need, I want to help. Can you help me help those who mm -hmm. are in need? But that infrastructure, the way you describe it, is exactly how it is now. It's super complex that sometimes it's hard, especially if you're sitting in that architecture, mm -hmm. to see, am I really making a difference? Yeah. It sounds like the system has taken over. And yeah. Basically. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You focus on engineering change and not just responding to it. Mm -hmm. How do you build a movement or build change from the ground up? Give people the freedom to really decide what they want. I know that can sound like <laughs> incendiary during these times when people feel like we've given democracy a free reign. You mm -hmm. have how many parties in the elections? Some of them are questionable fighting for a place in government. Mm -hmm. But really the core of change is people decide what they want for their lives, not uh, some elite groups mm -hmm. and we are part of that elite. I am part of that yeah. elite. Uh, but really, our job is to mm -hmm. provide the space for people to be able to find their voice and exercise that voice. And as we do that, I think it's important, like for me, the work that I do is helping people like you and me be able to step back and encourage everyone, including mm -hmm. those we want to encourage, to not be consumed by the present. And that's what I mean by engineering change. When you're always consumed by the present, you tend to just keep responding, mm -hmm. right? You're always in this emergency mode. Oh, a pandemic happened. Now let's do this. Oh, now we're transitioning from the pandemic. Now let's do this. But how about we do it a different way where you game out possible futures? Because mm -hmm. there's a way to know what kind of future or at least characteristics of that future is going to happen. And then prepare today. Mm -hmm. for that future and have your actions today be informed by these possible futures. So that's a big chunk of the work that I focus on now, which is helping social change actors practice what we call foresight or futures thinking, mm -hmm. which is thinking about the future and not just being consumed by the present. How can we in the creative industry uh, support civil society and contribute to positive change? Oh, a lot of ways, a lot of ways. I'll give you an example of what exactly you guys can do. So there's this, so in my old job, I was running a narrative, um, narrative change labs mm -hmm. in different parts of the world for human rights activists and social change uh, organizations. And what we did was to pair them up, build a team of non-human rights people, basically people like you, mm -hmm. build a team like them, to work with those human rights and social change actors. And these people who came in pro bono, we, we, we had no money to pay them. Yeah. They gave their time for two to three days working with these social change actors to understand, okay, what's your narrative challenge? And then let's come up with ideas. Mm -hmm. Let's come up with a campaign or a communication strategy. And oh my gosh, we I did this one in Taipei before the pandemic hit. Mm -hmm. It was a room full of the best creative uh, creative people, ad agency experts from the Philippines. Mm -hmm. And they just lit up the room like that. And they came up with ideas so brilliant, it blew the minds away of these uh, social change actors. And I remember one of them, she's this young ad agency executive, brilliant. She wrote me a letter afterwards and she said, thank you, Chris, for giving me this chance to be here and use my talent not just to sell shampoo. I now know I can sell more than shampoo. Mm -hmm. I can help these people make a difference in the lives of people who are detained, people who are suffering from the killings of persons who are killings in the drug war of the mm -hmm. present of the Philippines by my creative talent. And so this group of ad agency people, creative people, now banded together, call, calling themselves the Hope Project. Mm -hmm. And they're putting in their time and their energy and their resources to be basically a consultant to the social change field in the Philippines for free. They're not charging them anything. They're just giving their skills mm -hmm. to help them, these social change actors, win hearts and minds. There's so much you can do. And yeah. the thing is, people from my field don't know that they can reach out to you. Yeah. They don't know that many people like you who are so talented are willing to give your time mm -hmm. and your and your skills 
to help them. They yeah. don't know even to reach out. So there's so much that can be done. You just have to put all these people in one room and magic can happen. Yeah. Krishna, thank you very much for sharing your knowledge and your story with us. It's You're been uh, it's thank been really you. inspiring talking to you. And uh, I wish you all the best for the future. And uh, hopefully we speak soon. So take care. Thanks, Mitchell. Thank you. <laughs>